itself. But whenever you have a durable asset, you want to distinguish between two very different concepts. One is on the quantity side. And I think I might have talked about this before. On the quantity side, we want to think about there being a stock of assets, KT. That's the amount of assets we have at date T. And the amount of assets we have at date T is the amount of assets we had at T minus 1. So that's what it means these assets are durable. That is, the assets we already had yesterday are going to carry over to today. right? So think of like houses. We have a bunch of houses. A year from now, we're, even if we don't build any new ones, we're still going to have some houses. We have a bunch of tractors. A year from now, we're going to have tractors, factories. Labor is an asset viewed that way, that we're going to have, we'll still have people next year. And we, but we can add to that stock by doing what's called investment. IT. That's going to be my new investment. So in the housing market, this might be building new houses. It might be adding on to existing houses. In the context of land, it might be filling in a swamp and making it into usable land. It also might be actually increasing the quality of the land. That is, investing in making the land more usable, have more effective land. Right? Just like when we measure consumption goods, we don't want to just count acres. We want to measure land in some much more efficiency units. It's a much better measure of quantity to take account of both the quality and quantity elements of the Problem. And then, and then minus depreciation. And depreciation is what you can think of as land or machines that are either reduced in their quality because they're getting older, right? They kind of deteriorate as they get older. Or maybe they get destroyed in an accident, right? There's a lot of ways in which things depreciate, okay? All right. So those would be the kinds of ideas. Now, the most common model we use in economics is we're just going to say depreciation equals delta kt minus 1. So this is what we call the depreciation rate. That is the most common model that economists use to describe depreciation. For a couple of reasons. One, as an empirical matter, it's not an awful model. That is, for many goods, it's not a terrible approximation of the world. Secondly, it's going to turn out to simplify our life enormously. Because when assets depreciate at a constant rate, all assets of different ages are perfect substitutes. That's one thing. But not only are they perfect substitutes, you can aggregate them up in such a way that they still depreciate at a constant rate, right? That is, if delta is 0.9, an asset yesterday is equivalent to 90% of an asset today. And I don't care from today forward whether I had 10-year-old ones or nine brand new ones. Doesn't matter. They're equivalent. If delta is 0.1, 10 units built yesterday will be the exact equivalent, not just today, but from today to the end of time, to nine units built today. That's the key thing that comes out of exponential depreciation. There's a single state variable, which is just this aggregate of past production. That is KT equals IT plus 1 minus delta it minus 1 plus 1 minus delta squared it minus 2 plus dot, 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 dot. Just keep going. That is, I can build this capital aggregate, which uses what's called this perpetual inventory method to calculate today's capital stock as just past investment with this fixed depreciation rate, which because this is a constant, I can rewrite as IT plus 1 minus delta KT minus 1. That is, once I've calculated KT minus 1, I can forget about all those past I's. 
what they are is irrelevant. They're gone. There's, this is like a sufficient statistic. For those of you who like statistics, KT minus 1 is like a sufficient statistic for past investment. That is, the whole investment history is summarized in KT minus 1. If I had non-exponential depreciation, but maintained the assumption that capital of different ages was perfect substitutes, I would still be able to construct a capital aggregate at each date and time from the point of view of today's production. I would just aggregate them according to how good they are relative to one another, fixed perfect substitutes. But when I wanted to think about depreciation, I'd have to break them apart again because they don't depreciate at the same rate given their ages. Different ones of different ages depreciate at different rates. So exponential depreciation is nice because it embodies both this idea that everything's perfect substitutes, just at not one for one rates, but also it means that they also depreciate at the same rate no matter how old they are, which allows me to keep track of my capital stock in this really convenient recursive way. I calculate today's capital stock, I forget the past, I can then calculate tomorrow's capital stock. I, there's no history dependence beyond the whole past comes through that one number. That one number summarizes the whole history of what's happened up till today. And that's going to make my life easy when I try to think about the dynamics of this model. Right? And that's one of the things that accounts for the great popularity of this model. Yeah? Okay, let me, let me come back to that. In the, can, can you hold on to that for a second? All right, because I'm going to write another equation on the board, and if you find that one intuitive, then you've got to buy my version of this one. If you don't like that one, then, you, then, then, we, then we can think about it, okay? Because there's another equation. Okay, so, and I'll explain it to you in a minute. All right, so, uh, just like we can now think about there are two notions of quantities. Whenever you have a durable asset now, we have to think about two different notions. One is the stock, and the other is the flow of new investment. And when the assets are very durable, those numbers can be just so different. Like in the housing market, the quantity of houses we have and the quantity of houses we build in a given year are just like dramatically different concepts. One of them is incredibly volatile, like the amount of houses we build each year bounces around all over the place. In a given city, it might go from zero to 20 times its average value year to year, right? So huge amounts of fluctuation. Although otherwise, otherwise, the housing stock moves like a dinosaur, right? It just kind of like creeps along. It doesn't move very fast, right? It moves very slow, assuming dinosaurs were slow. Anyway. <laughs> 